Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, pronunciation, the 28th of May 1883 to the 26th of February 1966, was an Indian freedom fighter, barrister, and writer, known for his radical ideas to free India from British rule. Savarkar coined the term Hindutva, Hinduness, to create a collective Hindu identity as an essence of Bharat India. Savarkar was also a pragmatic practitioner of Hindu philosophy. He insisted for validating religious myths, blind faith against the test of modern science. In that sense he also was a rationalist. Savarkar's revolutionary activities began while studying in India and England, where he was associated with the India House and founded student societies including Abhinav Bharat Society and the Free India Society, as well as publications espousing the cause of complete Indian independence by revolutionary means. Savarkar published the Indian War of Independence about the Indian Rebellion of 1857 that was banned by British authorities. He was arrested in 1910 for his connections with the revolutionary group India House. Following a failed attempt to escape while being transported from Marseille, Savarkar was sentenced to two life terms of imprisonment totaling 50 years and was moved to the cellular jail in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, but released in 1921 after several mercy petitions to the Britishers. While in prison, Savarkar wrote the work describing Hindutva, espousing what it means to be a Hindu, and Hindu pride, in which he defined as all the people descended of Hindu culture as being part of Hindutva, including Buddhists, Jains and Sikhs. In 1921, under restrictions after signing a plea for clemency, he was released on the condition that he renounce revolutionary activities. Traveling widely, Savarkar became a forceful orator and writer, advocating Hindu political and social unity. Serving as the president of the Hindu Mahasabha, Savarkar endorsed the idea of India as a Hindu rashtra and opposed the Quit India struggle in 1942, calling it a Quit India but keep your army movement. He became a fierce critic of the Indian National Congress and its acceptance of India's partition. He was accused of the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi but acquitted by the court. His role in the assassination was later established by Kapur Commission in 1969. The airport at Port Blair, Andaman and Nicobar's capital, has been named Veer Savarkar International Airport. The commemorative blue plaque on India House fixed by the Historic Building and Monuments Commission for England reads, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar 1883-1966 Indian patriot and philosopher lived here. Early life Vinayak Damodar Savarkar was born in the Marathi Chitpavan Brahmin Hindu family of Damodar and Radhabai Savarkar in the village of Bhagore, near the city of Nashik, Maharashtra. He had three other siblings namely Ganesh, Narayan, and a sister named Maina. He earned the nickname, Veer, Sanskrit, Braveheart, when at the age of twelve, he led fellow students against a rampaging horde of Muslims that attacked his village. Highly outnumbered, he inspired the boys to fight on until the last Muslim was driven off. Later, he is known to have stated, Do not fear them. The Almighty is your strength, so fight, even when facing an enemy stronger than yourself. After the death of his parents, the eldest sibling Ganesh, known as Babarao, took responsibility for the family. Babarao played a supportive and influential role in Vinayak's teenage life. During this period, Vinayak organized a youth group called Mitra Mela Band of Friends and encouraged revolutionary and nationalist views of passion using this group. In 1901, Vinayak Savarkar married Yamunabai, daughter of Ramchandra Triambak Chiplunkar, who supported his university education. Subsequently, in 1902, he enrolled in Ferguson College, in Pune. As a young man, he was inspired by the new generation of radical political leaders namely Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Bipin Chandra Pal and Lala Lajpat Rai along with the political struggle against the partition of Bengal and the rising Swadeshi campaign. After completing his degree, nationalist activist Shyamji Krishna Varma helped Vinayak to go to England to study law, on a scholarship. It was during this period that the Garam Dal, literally, Army of the Angry, was formed under the leadership of Tilak as a result of a split between the moderate, constitutionalist, wing on the one part, and of Tilak's extremist or radical wing in the Indian National Congress. 
The members of the Garam Dal did not acknowledge the agenda of the majority moderate Indian National Congress leadership which advocated dialogue with the British rulers and incremental steps towards independence by gaining the confidence of the British. Tillich was soon imprisoned for his support of revolutionary activities. Activities at India House After joining Gray's Inn Law College in London Vinayak took accommodation at India House. Organised by expatriate social and political activist Pandit Shyamji, India House was a thriving centre for student political activities. Savarkar soon founded the Free India Society to help organise fellow Indian students with the goal of fighting for complete independence through a revolution, declaring, we must stop complaining about this British officer or that officer, this law or that law. There would be no end to that. Our movement must not be limited to being against any particular law, but it must be for acquiring the authority to make laws itself. In other words, we want absolute independence. Savarkar envisioned a guerrilla war for independence along the lines of the famous War for Indian Independence of 1857. Studying the history of the revolt, from English as well as Indian sources, Savarkar wrote the book, The History of the War of Indian Independence. He analysed the circumstances of 1857 uprising and assailed British rule in India as unjust and oppressive. It was via this book that Savarkar became one of the first writers to elude the uprising as India's first war for independence. The book was banned throughout the British Empire. Madame Bikaji Kama, an expatriate Indian revolutionary obtained its publication in the Netherlands, France and Germany. Widely smuggled and circulated, the book attained great popularity and influenced rising young Indians. Savarkar was studying revolutionary methods and he came into contact with a veteran of the Russian Revolution of 1905 who imparted him the knowledge of bomb-making. Savarkar had printed and circulated a manual amongst his friends on bomb-making and other methods of guerrilla warfare. In 1909, Maidan Lal Dingra, a keen follower and friend of Savarkar, assassinated Sir William Hutt Curzon Willie in a public meeting. Dingra's action provoked controversy across Britain and India, evoking enthusiastic admiration as well as condemnation. Savarkar published an article in which he all but endorsed the murder and worked to organise support, both political and for Dingra's legal defence. At a meeting of Indians called for a condemnation of Dingra's deed, Savarkar protested the intention to condemn and was drawn into a hot debate and angry scuffle with other participants. A secretive and restricted trial and a sentence awarding the death penalty to Dingra provoked an outcry and protest across the Indian student and political community. Strongly protesting the verdict, Savarkar struggled with British authorities in laying claim to Dingra's remains following his execution. Savarkar hailed Dingra as a hero and martyr, and began encouraging revolution with greater intensity. <inaudible> Arrest in London and Marseille In India, Ganesh Savarkar had organised an armed revolt against the Morley Minto reforms of 1909. The British police implicated Savarkar in the investigation for allegedly plotting the crime. Hoping to evade arrest, Savarkar moved to Madame Kama's home in Paris. He was nevertheless arrested by police on 13 March 1910. In the final days of freedom, Savarkar wrote letters to a close friend planning his escape. Knowing that he would most likely be shipped to India, Savarkar asked his friend to keep track of which ship and route he would be taken through. When the ship SS Morea reached the port of Marseille on 8 July 1910, Savarkar escaped from his cell in the hope that his friend would be there to receive him in a car. But his friend was late in arriving, and the alarm having been raised, Savarkar was re-arrested. <laughs> Case before the Permanent Court of Arbitration Savarkar's arrest at Marseille caused the French government to protest to the British, arguing that the British could not recover Savarkar unless they took appropriate legal proceedings for his rendition. The dispute came before the Permanent Court of International Arbitration in 1910, and it gave its decision in 1911. The case excited much controversy as was reported by the New York Times, and it considered it involved an interesting international question of the right of asylum. 
The court held, firstly, that since there was a pattern of collaboration between the two countries regarding the possibility of Savarkar's escape in Marseille and there was neither force nor fraud in inducing the French authorities to return Savarkar to them, the British authorities did not have to hand him back to the French in order for the latter to hold rendition proceedings. On the other hand, the tribunal also observed that there had been an irregularity in Savarkar's arrest and delivery over to the Indian Army Military Police Guard. Trial and sentence Arriving in Bombay, Savarkar was taken to the Yervada Central Jail in Pune. The trial before the Special Tribunal was started on 10 September 1910. One of the charges on Savarkar was he abetted murder. Following a trial, Savarkar, aged 28, was convicted and sentenced to 50 years imprisonment and transported on 4 July 1911 to the infamous cellular jail in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. He was not considered by the British government as a political prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> prisoner in cellular jail in Andaman His fellow captives included many political prisoners, who were forced to perform hard labor for many years. Reunited with his brother Ganesh, the Savarkars nevertheless struggled in the harsh environment, forced to arise at 5 a.m., tasks including cutting trees and chopping wood, and working at the oil mill under regimental strictness, with talking amidst prisoners strictly prohibited during mealtime. Prisoners were subject to frequent mistreatment and torture. Contact with the outside world and home was restricted to the writing and mailing of one letter a year. In these years, Savarkar withdrew within himself and performed his routine tasks mechanically. Obtaining permission to start a rudimentary jail library, Savarkar would also teach some fellow convicts to read and write. <laughs> Mercy petitions Savarkar applied to the Bombay government for certain concessions in connection with his sentences. However, by Government Letter No. 2022, dated 4 April 1911, his application was rejected and he was informed that the question of remitting the second sentence of transportation for life would be considered in due course on the expiry of the first sentence of transportation for life. Merely a month after arriving in the cellular jail, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Savarkar submitted his first mercy petition on 30 August 1911. This petition was rejected on the 3rd of September 1911. Savarkar submitted his next mercy petition on November 14, 1913, and presented it personally to the home member of the Governor General's Council, Sir Reginald Craddock. In his letter asking for forgiveness, he described himself as a prodigal son, longing to return to the parental doors of the government. He wrote that his release from the jail will recast the faith of many Indians in the British rule. Also, he said. Moreover, my conversion to the constitutional line would bring back all those misled young men in India and abroad who were once looking up to me as their guide. I am ready to serve the government in any capacity they like, for as my conversion is conscientious so I hope my future conduct would be. By keeping me in jail, nothing can be got in comparison to what would be otherwise. In 1917, Savarkar submitted another mercy petition, this time for a general amnesty of all political prisoners. Savarkar was informed on February 1, 1918 that the mercy petition was placed before the British Indian government. In December 1919, there was a royal proclamation by King Emperor George V. The summary of this proclamation is as follows. Paragraph 1, reference to Acts of 1773, 1784, 1833, 1858, 1861 and 1909. The Act of 1919 entrusts the elected representatives of the people with a definite share in government and points the way to full responsible government hereafter. Paragraph 2, mention of what Queen Victoria, King Edward VII and he himself declared between 1858 and 1910. Paragraph 3, Britain's desire to make it possible for India to take the control of her domestic affairs on her own shoulders. Paragraph 4, recognition of the political awakening and political aspirations of the people of the country. Paragraph 5, hope that the new legislatures shall succeed. Paragraph 6, an appeal to forgive and forget for removing all bitterness and creating an atmosphere of goodwill for the success of the reforms. 
Declaration of Royal Clemency to Political Offenders. Paragraph 7, Reference to Chamber of Princes. Paragraph 8, Intention of sending Prince of Wales to visit India to further cordiality of relations between the King and his subjects. In the view of royal proclamation, Savarkar submitted his fourth mercy petition to the British government on 30 March 1920, in which he stated that so far from believing in the militant school of the Buchanan type, I do not contribute even to the peaceful and philosophical anarchism of a Kuropatkin Sikh, or a Tolstoy. And as to my revolutionary tendencies in the past, it is not only now for the object of sharing the clemency but years before this have I informed of and written to the government in my petitions 1918, 1914 about my firm intention to abide by the Constitution and stand by it as soon as a beginning was made to frame it by Mr. Montague. Since that the reforms and then the proclamation have only confirmed me in my views and recently I have publicly avowed my faith in and readiness to stand by the side of orderly and constitutional development." This petition was rejected on 12 July 1920 by the British government. After considering the petition, the British government contemplated releasing Ganesh Savarkar but not Vinayak Savarkar. The rationale for doing so was stated as follows. It may be observed that if Ganesh is released and Vinayak retained in custody, the latter will become in some measure a hostage for the former, who will see that his own misconduct does not jeopardize his brother's chances of release at some future date. In 1920, the Indian National Congress and leaders such as Mahatma Gandhi, Vithalbhai Patel and Bal Gangadhar Tilak demanded his unconditional release. Savarkar signed a statement endorsing his trial, verdict and British law, and renouncing violence, a bargain for freedom. Jaywant Joglaker, who authored a book eulogizing Savarkar as father of Hindu nationalism, considers Savarkar's appeal for clemency a tactical ploy, like Shivaji's letter to Aurangzeb, during his arrest at Agra etc. However, such claims are disputed by others. The Indian historian Bhipan Chandra claimed that post Savarkar's release from jail, he was not an anti-imperialist any longer, and that he accepted the humiliating conditions of his release set forth by the British government, including his non-participation in politics. A portrait of Savarkar was unveiled in the Indian Parliament in 2003. Topic: <laughs> Restricted freedom in Ritnagira. On 2 May 1921, the Savarkar brothers were moved to a jail in Ritnagira, and later to the Yerwada Central Jail. He was finally released on 6 January 1924 under stringent restrictions. He was not to leave Ritnagira district and was to refrain from political activities for the next five years. As a political internee in Ritnagira he demanded an amount of 100 rupees per month. The British government agreed on a stipend of 60 rupees per month in lieu of his compulsory unemployment. However, police restrictions on his activities would not be dropped until provincial autonomy was granted in 1937. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Leader of the Hindu Mahasabha. In the wake of the rising popularity of the Muslim League led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Savarkar and his party began gaining attraction in the national political environment. Savarkar moved to Bombay and was elected president of the Hindu Mahasabha in 1937, and would serve until 1943. The Congress swept the polls in 1937 but conflicts between the Congress and Jinnah would exacerbate Hindu-Muslim political divisions. Jinnah derided Congress rule as a Hindu Raj, and hailed the 22nd of December 1939 as a day of deliverance. For Muslims when the Congress resigned en masse in protest when the British India Governor-General declared India's inclusion into World War II for the United Kingdom and its allies against Germany and its allies. Savarkar's message of Hindu unity and empowerment gained increasing popularity amidst the worsening communal climate. Savarkar as president of the Hindu Mahasabha, during the Second World War, advanced the slogan, Hinduis all politics and militarize Hindutum. He decided to support the British war effort in India seeking military training for the Hindus. When the Congress launched the Quit India movement in 1942, Savarkar criticised it and asked Hindus to stay active in the war effort and not disobey the government. He urged the Hindus to enlist in the armed forces to learn the arts of war. 
Hindu Mahasabha activists protested Gandhi's initiative to hold talks with Jinnah in 1944, which Savarkar denounced as appeasement. He assailed the British proposals for transfer of power, attacking both the Congress and the British for making concessions to Muslim separatists. Soon after independence, Dr. Shyama Prasad Mukherjee resigned as vice president of the Hindu Mahasabha dissociating himself from its Akhand Hindustan plank, which implied undoing partition. Opposition to Quit India movement Under Savarkar, the Hindu Mahasabha openly opposed the call for the Quit India movement and boycotted it officially. Savarkar even went to the extent of writing a letter titled, Stick to Your Posts, in which he instructed Hindu Sabet who happened to be members of municipalities, local bodies, legislatures, or those serving in the army. Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 to stick to their posts across the country and not to join the Quit India movement at any cost. Topic: <laughs> Alliance with Muslim League and others. The Indian National Congress won a massive victory in the Indian provincial elections 1937, decimating the Muslim League and the Hindu Mahasabha. However, in 1939, the Congress ministries resigned in protest against Viceroy Lord Linlithgow's action of declaring India to be a belligerent in the Second World War without consulting the Indian people. This led to the Hindu Mahasabha, under Savarkar's presidency, joining hands with the Muslim League and other parties to form governments, in certain provinces. Such coalition governments were formed in Sindh, NWFP, and Bengal. In Sindh, Hindu Mahasabha members joined Ghulam Hussain Hidayatullah's Muslim League government. In Savarkar's own words, "...witness the fact that only recently in Sindh, the Sindh Hindu Sabha on invitation had taken the responsibility of joining hands with the League itself in running coalition government in March 1943. Sindh government became the first provincial assembly of the subcontinent to pass an official resolution in favour of the creation of Pakistan." In spite of the Hindu Mahasabha's avowed public opposition to any political division of India, the Mahasabha ministers of the Sindh government did not resign, rather they simply contented themselves with a protest in the northwest frontier province. Hindu Mahasabha members joined hands with Sardar Aurangzeb Khan of the Muslim League to form a government in 1943. The Mahasabha member of the cabinet was Finance Minister Mahar Chan Khanna. In Bengal, Hindu Mahasabha joined the Krishak Praja Party led Progressive Coalition Ministry of Fazlul Haq in December, 1941. Savarkar appreciated the successful functioning of the coalition government. <laughs> <laughs> Civil resistance movement Hindu Mahasabha under the leadership of Savarkar started a civil resistance movement in March 1939. The objective of the Satyagraha was to secure religious and cultural liberty for the Hindus who at that time constituted 86% of total population of Hyderabad state. Many notable people like Senapati Bapat, V. G. Deshpand, Prabhakar Balwant Dhani, Madhavrao Mule, took part in it. The Arya Samaj also sent around 10,000 civil resistors. At last, on July 19, 1939, the Nizam government announced some political reforms. In the new dispensation, 50% seats were left for non-Muslims. Although Hindus were the majority in the state and Muslims were in minority, Hindu Mahasabha accepted this proposal. They withdrew the movement despite the fact that these reforms for partial reforms. Indian National Congress did not support this movement and called it communal and anti-national. Topic. Views on Mahatma Gandhi Savarkar was an outspoken critic of Mahatma Gandhi. He criticized Gandhi for being a hypocrite as he supported use of violence by the British against Germany during World War II. He also criticized his appeasement of Muslims at the time of Khilafat movement. In articles from the 1920s to the 1940s Savarkar considered Gandhi as a naive leader who happens to babble about compassion, forgiveness. Yet, 
Notwithstanding his sublime and broad heart, the Mahatma has a very narrow and immature head. Opposition to the partition of India Dr. Ambedkar's opinion about Savarkar's position is as follows. Strange as it may appear, Mr. Savarkar and Mr. Jinnah, instead of being opposed to each other on the one nation versus two nations issue, are in complete agreement about it. Both agree, not only agree but insist, that there are two nations in India, one the Muslim nation and the other the Hindu nation. They differ only as regards the terms and conditions on which the two nations should live. Mr. Jinnah says India should be cut up into two, Pakistan and Hindustan, the Muslim nation to occupy Pakistan and the Hindu nation to occupy Hindustan. Mr. Savarkar on the other hand insists that, although there are two nations in India, India shall not be divided into two parts, one for Muslims and the other for the Hindus, that the two nations shall dwell in one country and shall live under the mantle of one single constitution, that the constitution shall be such that the Hindu nation will be enabled to occupy a predominant position that is due to it and the Muslim nation made to live in the position of subordinate cooperation with the Hindu nation. In the struggle for political power between, the two nations the rule of the game which Mr. Savarkar prescribes is to be one man one vote, be the man Hindu or Muslim. In his scheme a Muslim is to have no advantage which a Hindu does not have. Minority is to be no justification for privilege and majority is to be no ground for penalty. The state will guarantee the Muslims any defined measure of political power in the form of Muslim religion and Muslim culture. But the state will not guarantee secured seats in the legislature or in the administration and, if such guarantee is insisted upon by the Muslims, 16, such guaranteed quota is not to exceed their proportion to the general population. Thus by confiscating its weightages, Mr. Savarkar would even strip the Muslim nation of all the political privileges it has secured so far." On 1943 Savarkar himself expressed his strong support for Jinnah's demand for separate nation for Muslims before partition which ended all confusion regarding his view on this matter. On August 15, 1943 in Nagpur, he unequivocally said, I have no quarrel with Mr. Jinnah's two-nation theory. We, Hindus, are a nation by ourselves and it is a historical fact that Hindus and Muslims are two nations. <laughs> Support for Jewish state in Palestine Savarkar in a statement issued on 19 December 1947, expressed joy at the recognition of the claim of Jewish people to establish an independent Jewish state, and likened the event to the glorious day on which Moses led them out of Egyptian bondage. He considered that justice demanded restoration of entire Palestine to the Jews, their historical holy land and fatherland. He regretted India's vote at the United Nations against the creation of the Jewish state terming the vote a policy of appeasement of Muslims. Arrest and acquittal in Mahatma's assassination Following the assassination of Gandhi on 30 January 1948, police arrested the assassin Nathuram Godse and his alleged accomplices and conspirators. He was a member of the Hindu Mahasabha and of the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh. Godse was the editor of Agrani, Hindu Rashtra, a Marathi daily from Pune which was run by the company. The Hindu Rashtra Precaution Limited, the Hindu Nation Publications. This company had contributions from such eminent persons as Gulabchand Harachan, Balji Pendharkar, and Hugakishore Birla. Savarkar had invested 15,000 rupees in the company. Savarkar, a former president of the Hindu Mahasabha, was arrested on 5 February 1948, from his house in Shivaji Park, and kept under detention in the Arthur Road Prison, Mumbai. He was charged with murder, conspiracy to murder and abatement to murder. A day before his arrest, Savarkar in a public written statement, as reported in the Times of India, Mumbai dated 7 February 1948, termed Gandhi's assassination a fratricidal crime, endangering India's existence as a nascent nation. 
The mass of papers seized from his house had revealed nothing that could remotely be connected with Gandhi's murder. Due to lack of evidence, Savarkar was arrested under the Preventive Detention Act. Topic: <laughs> Approver's testimony. Godse claimed full responsibility for planning and carrying out the assassination. However, according to the approver badge, on 17 January 1948, Nathuram Godse went to have a last darshan audience, interview, with Savarkar in Bombay before the assassination. While Badge and Shankar waited outside, Nathuram and APTE went in. On coming out APTE told Badge that Savarkar blessed them. Yashasvi haun ya. Yashasvi huna ya. Be successful and return. APTE also said that Savarkar predicted that Gandhi's 100 years were over and there was no doubt that the task would be successfully finished. However Badge's testimony was not accepted as the approver's evidence lacked independent corroboration and hence Savarkar was acquitted. In the last week of August 1974, Mr. Manohar Malgonkar saw Digamber Badge several times and in particular, questioned him about the veracity of his testimony against Savarkar. Badge insisted to Mr. Manohar Malgonkar that, even though he had blurted out the full story of the plot as far as he knew, without much persuasion, he had put up a valiant struggle against being made to testify against Savarkar. In the end, Badge gave in. He agreed to say on oath that he saw Nathuram Godse and APTE with Savarkar and that Savarkar, within Badge's hearing, had blessed their venture. Topic. Kapur Commission On 12 November 1964, at a religious program organized in Pune to celebrate the release of Gopal Godse, Madanlal Pawa and Vishnu Karkari from jail after the expiry of their sentences, Dr. G. V. Kakar, grandson of Bal Gangadhar Tilak, former editor of Kesari and then editor of Tarun Bharat who presided over the function, gave information of a conspiracy to kill Gandhi, about which he professed knowledge six months before the act. Kitkar was arrested. A public furor ensued both outside and inside the Maharashtra Legislative Assembly and both houses of the Indian Parliament. Under pressure of 29 members of Parliament and public opinion the then Union Home Minister Gulzarilal Nanda appointed Gopal Swarup Padak, MP and a senior advocate of the Supreme Court of India as a commission of inquiry to re-investigate the conspiracy to murder Gandhi. The central government intended on conducting a thorough inquiry with the help of old records in consultation with the government of Maharashtra. Patak was given three months to conduct his inquiry. Subsequently, Jevanlal Kapur, a retired judge of the Supreme Court of India, was appointed chairman of the commission. The Kapur Commission was provided with evidence not produced in the court, especially the testimony of two of Savarkar's close aides, Appa Ramachandra Kassar, his bodyguard, and Gajanan Vishnu Damal, his secretary. The testimony of Mr. Kasser and Mr. Damal was already recorded by Bombay Police on 4 March 1948, but apparently, these testimonies were not presented before the court during the trial. In these testimonies, it is said that Godse and APTE visited Savarkar on or about 23 or 24 January, which was when they returned from Delhi after the bomb incident. Damal deposed that Godse and APTE saw Savarkar in the middle of January and sat with him Savarkar in his garden. The CID Bombay was keeping vigil on Savarkar from 21 to 30 January 1948. The crime report from CID does not mention Godse or APTE met Savarkar during this time. Moreover, if testimonies of Mr. Kasser and Mr. Damal were so damning then it is not clear why Bombay police did not produce them before the court during the trial. This suggests that testimonies might have been obtained under the police pressure. Justice Kapper concluded, All these facts taken together were destructive of any theory other than the conspiracy to murder by Savarkar and his group. The arrest of V.D. Savarkar was mainly based on approver Digambar Badge's testimony. The commission did not re-interview Digambar Badge. At the time of inquiry of the commission, Badge was alive and working in Bombay. Later life and death After Gandhi's assassination Savarkar's home in Dadar, Mumbai was stoned by angry mobs. 
After he was acquitted of the allegations related to Gandhi's assassination and released from jail, Savarkar was arrested by the government, for making militant Hindu nationalist speeches. He was released after agreeing to give up political activities. He continued addressing social and cultural elements of Hindutva. He resumed political activism after the ban on it was lifted. It was however limited until his death in 1966 because of ill health. His followers bestowed upon him honors and financial awards when he was alive. 2,000 RSS workers gave his funeral procession a guard of honor. According to McKean, there was public antipathy between Savarkar and the Congress for most of his political career, yet after independence Congress ministers, Vallabhbhai Patel and C. D. Deshmukh unsuccessfully sought partnership with the Hindu Mahasabha and Savarkar. It was forbidden for Congress party members to participate in public functions honoring Savarkar. Nehru refused to share the stage during the centenary celebrations of the India's first war of independence held in Delhi. After the independence of India, Jawaharlal Nehru had put forward a proposal to demolish the cellular jail in the Andaman and build a hospital in its place. After the death of Nehru, the Congress government, under Prime Minister Shastri, started to pay him a monthly pension. Death On 8 November 1963, Savarkar's wife, Yamuna, died. On 1 February 1966, Savarkar renounced medicines, food and water which he termed as Atmarpan fast until death. Before his death he had written an article titled, Atmahatya Nahi Atmarpan, in which he argued that when one's life mission is over and ability to serve the society is left no more, it is better to end the life at will rather than waiting for death. His condition was described to have become as extremely serious before his death on 26 February 1966 at his residence in Bombay, now Mumbai, and that he faced difficulty in breathing. Efforts to revive him failed and was declared dead at 11.10 a.m. East that day. Prior to his death, Savarkar had asked his relatives to perform only his funeral and do away with the rituals of the 10th and 13th day of the Hindu faith. Accordingly, his last rites were performed at an electric crematorium in Mumbai's Sonapur locality by his son Vishwas the following day. He was mourned by large crowds that attended his cremation. He left behind a son Vishwas and a daughter Prabha Chiplunkar. His first son, Prabhakar, had died in infancy. His home, possessions, and other personal relics have been preserved for public display. There was no official mourning by the then Congress Party government of Maharashtra or at the center. The indifference to Savarkar continued long after his death. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Political views. Topic: <inaudible> 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 Hindu nationalism. During his incarceration, Savarkar's views began turning increasingly towards Hindu cultural and political nationalism, and the next phase of his life remained dedicated to this cause. In the brief period he spent at the Ritnagira jail, Savarkar wrote his ideological treatise, Hindutva, Who is a Hindu? Smuggled out of the prison, it was published by Savarkar's supporters under his alias, Maharata. In this work, Savarkar promotes a radical new vision of Hindu social and political consciousness. Savarkar began describing a Hindu as a patriotic inhabitant of Bharatavarsha, venturing beyond a religious identity. While emphasizing the need for patriotic and social unity of all Hindu communities, he described Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism and Buddhism as one and the same. He outlined his vision of a Hindu Rashtra Hindu nation as Akhand Bharat, united India, purportedly stretching across the entire Indian subcontinent. He defined Hindus as being neither Aryan nor Dravidian but as people who live as children of a common motherland, adoring a common holy land. Scholars, historians and Indian politicians have been divided in their interpretation of Savarkar's ideas. A self-described atheist, Savarkar regards being Hindu as a cultural and political identity. He often stressed social and community unity between Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists and Jains, to the exclusion of Muslims and Christians. Savarkar saw Muslims and Christians as misfits in the Indian civilization who could not truly be a part of the nation. 
He argued that the holiest sites of Islam and Christianity are in the Middle East and not India, hence the loyalty of Muslims and Christians to India is divided, after his release from jail on 6 January 1924. Savarkar helped found the Ritnagira Hindu Sabha, aiming to work for the social and cultural preservation of Hindu heritage and civilization. Becoming a frequent and forceful orator, Sarvakar agitated for the use of Hindi as a common national language and against caste discrimination and untouchability. Another activity he started was to reconvert to Hinduism those who had converted to other faiths. This included the eight members of a Brahmin family named Dakras who had converted to Christianity. Savarkar re-converted the family at a public function and also bore the marriage expenses of the two daughters in the family, focusing his energies on writing. Savarkar authored the Hindu Pad Pada Shahi, a book documenting the Maratha Empire, and My Transportation for Life, an account of his early revolutionary days, arrest, trial, and incarceration. He also wrote and published a collection of poems, plays, and novels. He also wrote a book named Maji Janmatap, My Life Term about his experience in Andaman prison. <laughs> Fascism and World War II In many of Savarkar's speeches and writings, he praises Nazi ideology. Savarkar criticized Nehru for opposing Nazism, arguing, "...surely Hitler knows better than Pandit Nehru does what suits Germany best." In his 1949 book, Hindu Rashtra Darshan, Savarkar wrote, "...Nazism proved undeniably the savior of Germany." Savarkar often compared Germany's German majority and Jewish minority as analogous to India's Hindu majority and Muslim minority, though Savarkar never mentions the persecution of Jews in Germany. Savarkar never said that he was a proponent of murder and genocide against minorities, and instead desired peaceful assimilation. Savarkar condemned both German Jews and the Indian Muslims for their supposed inability to assimilate. In 1938, he wrote, If we Hindus in India grow stronger in time, these Muslim friends of the League type will have to play the part of German Jews. He further added that India must be a Hindu land, reserved for Hindus. <laughs> Jews. Savarkar supported the establishment of the Jewish State of Israel, which was not only in the spirit of his nationalism but also what Savarkar saw in the Jewish State as a barricade against the Muslim Arab world. Muslims Rachel McDermott, Leonard A. Gordon, Ainsley Embree, Francis Pritchett and Dennis Dalton state that Savarkar promoted an anti-Muslim form of Hindu nationalism. Scholar Vinayak Chaturvedi states that Savarkar was known for his anti-Muslim writings. Savarkar saw Muslims in the Indian police and military to be potential traitors. He advocated that India reduce the number of Muslims in the military, police and public service and ban Muslims from owning or working in munitions factories. Savarkar criticized Gandhi for being concerned about Indian Muslims. Chaturvedi notes that there was a shift in Savarkar's views. In his earlier writings, he argued for Indian independence from British rule, whereas in later writings, he focused on Hindu independence from Christians and Muslims. In his 1907 Indian War of Independence, Savarkar includes Muslims as heroes. This was omitted in his later writings. His 1925 Hindu Pad Patshahi included Hindu heroes but not Muslim ones. In his 1963 Six Glorious Epics, Savarkar says Muslims and Christians wanted to destroy Hinduism. <laughs> <laughs> Religious views Although Savarkar is regarded as a Hindu nationalist, he professed atheism It should however, be noted that atheism within Hinduism is different from its Western counterpart. Many Hindus do not profess belief in deities or a god, as it is not a single religion, but a collection of many diverse philosophies and faiths. Savarkar still had spirituality, and a mystical view of life, and gave great importance to mythology and symbolism. Publications 
Savarkar's literary works in Marathi include Kamala, Mazi Janmatep, My Life Sentence, and most famously 1857 The First War of Independence, in which Savarkar popularized the term First War of Independence for what the British referred to as the Sepoy Mutiny. Another book was Kale Pani, Black Water, which means life sentence, on the island prison on the Andaman Islands, which reflected the treatment of Indian independence activists by the British. To counter the then British propagated view that India's history was a saga of continuous defeat, he wrote an inspirational historical work, Saha Soneri Pain, six golden pages, recounting some of the golden periods of Indian history. At the same time, religious divisions in India were beginning to be exacerbated. He described what he saw as the atrocities of British and Muslims on Hindu residents in Kerala in the book, Mopalyanche Band Muslims Strike and also Gandhi Gandhal Gandhi's Confusion, a political critique of Gandhi's politics. Savarkar, by now, had become a committed and persuasive critic of the Gandhian vision of India's future. He is also the author of the poems Sagara Pran Tamalala, O Great Sea, My Heart Aches for the Motherland, and Jayastut, written in praise of freedom. When in the cellular jail, Savarkar was denied pen and paper. He composed and wrote his poems on the prison walls with thorns and pebbles, memorized thousands lines of his poetry for years till other prisoners returning home brought them to mainland India. Savarkar is credited with several neologisms in Marathi and Hindi, including Hutatma, martyr. Mahapower, Mayor, Digdarshak, leader or director, one who points in the right direction, Shotkar, a score of six runs in cricket, Saptahik, weekly, Sansid, Parliament, Dordwani, telephone, Tanklekan, typewriting, among others. He chaired Marathi Sahitya Samelan in 1938. Topic: <laughs> Selected bibliography. Savarkar Samagra, Complete Works of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar in 10 volumes, ISBN 81-7315-331-0 Essentials of Hindutva Nagpur, 1928. The Indian War of Independence, 1857. New Delhi, Rajdhani Granthnagar, 1970, 1st ed., 1908. Hindu Rashtra Darshan, a collection of presidential speeches delivered from the Hindu Mahasabha platform. Bombay, Kari, 1949. Six Glorious Epics of Indian History. Trans, and ed. S. T. Godball. Bombay, Veer Savarkar Prakashan, 1985. My Transportation for Life. Trans. V. N. Naik. Bombay, Veer Savarkar Prakashan, 1984, 1st ed., 1949. Saha Soneri Pain, Te. Saha Soneri Pain, Va, Saha Soneri Pani Translation, Six Glorious Epics of Indian History Joseph Mazzini on Giuseppe Mazzini 1857 Che Svatantriya Samar Hindupatpatshahi Jatayushadaka Nibanda Jatyakhedak Nibanda Moplianch Banda Mazi Janmatep Translation, My Life Imprisonment Kale Pani Shatruchya Shabirat Londonchi Bhatami Patra Translation, London Newsletters Andamanchya Andharitan Vijnyanenistha Nibanda Vidnian Nishtha Nibanda Hindarashtra Darshan Hindutvake Panchapran Kamala Mazi Janmatep Maji Janmathepa Savarkarantya Kavita Translation, Poems by Savarkar Sanyasta Kaj Satavanch Swatantriyasamar Satavanas Svatantriyasamara 1857 Che Swatantriya Center Vol. 1 Jawalamukhi, C. Svatantriya Samara Bhaga, Javamukhi 1857 Che Swatantriya Center Vol. 2 Svo, C. Svatantriya Samara Bhaga, Svota 1857 Che Swatantriya Center Vol. 3 Agnakalal C. Svatantriya Samara Bhaga, Agnakalala 1857 Che Swatantriya Center Vol. Fortit Porti Shantata, C. Svatantriya Samara Bhaga, Tatparati Santata Suicide and Self Sacrifice Translation Aata Marutiuche Swagat Karavi Ada Murtuche Svagata Karavi Amcharitya, Mazya Athavani Atmakaritra Magya Athavani Atmasharitya, Purvapithik Athang Atmakaritra Purvapithika Athanga 
Atmahatya ani atmarpan atmahatya ani atmarpana Idahasik nivdane adihasika nivdane Andamantya andharitan andamanasya andharituna Andhasharda nirmulan, part 1 Andasrata nirmalana katha Andhasharda nirmulan, part 2 Andasrata nirmalana katha 2 Bashadi lekh basa sudi leka Legacy In the 1996 Malayalam movie Kalapani directed by Priyadarshan, the Hindi actor Anu Kapoor played the role of Savarkar. The Marathi and Hindi music director and Savarkar follower, Sadir Fadke, and Ved Rahi made the biopic film Veer Savarkar, which was released in 2001 after many years in production. Savarkar is portrayed by Shailendra Gaur. A portrait of Savarkar was unveiled in the Indian Parliament in 2003. In the recent past, the Shiv Sena party has demanded that the Indian government posthumously confer upon him India's highest civilian award, the Bharat Ratna. Yudhav Thackeray, Shiv Sena chief, while reiterating this demand for Bharat Ratna in 2017, has also suggested that a replica of the prison cell where Savarkar was imprisoned should be built in Mumbai and the youth should be educated about Savarkar's contribution towards the Hindu Rashtra and the Indian freedom struggle. 